Oh, hey, glad you're here. I need you to look at this. I mean, what is this? So yeah, this is the monster in the movie Frankenstein and the monster from hell. But like, why did they make it look like a hideous ape? Like the ugliest ape I've ever seen. Why would Dr. Frankenstein create a monster that looks like this? Okay, you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to pull back. If you're new here, welcome to the Cobwebs channel. My name is Daniel. This is actually the sixth video in a review series on all of the Hammer Frankenstein films starring Peter Cushing. I've been reviewing each and every one. And today we're talking about Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, which is actually the seventh Hammer Frankenstein movie. You see, right before this, Hammer tried to reboot the series with Horror of Frankenstein. There they got a new actor to play Dr. Frankenstein, Ralph. Alf Bates, and the movie's actually a little bit of a semi-parody spoof of their first Frankenstein movie. I didn't do a dedicated video on that because I hate it. I hate that movie. I have no interest giving it its own dedicated video, but I will be covering it in the next video on the channel, which will be ranking all of the Hammer Frankenstein films. So if you're not subscribed, make sure you don't miss it. So Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell was actually shot in 1972, but came out in 1974. Now for a little bit of historical context, that's the year after The Exorcist came out, and it's the same year that The Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out. So that should give you an idea that this movie is behind the times. Horror was moving on, it was moving away from the period classic gothic horror film, and that showed in the box office receipts. Hammer, at this point, was on its last legs, and this film was actually the final film Terrence Fisher would direct. But I do think it's funny to compare this movie to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because of the two, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell is by far the gorier movie. But the movie opens up with a very atmospheric grave robbing scene in a very spooky graveyard and the body in question gets delivered to Dr. Simon Helder. Turns out this guy is a Frankenstein fanboy. He's got Frankenstein's books, records and he's trying to recreate that work, continue it, and build his own monster. So is this going to be another reboot with a new doctor? Well, no, because what happens is he gets caught, he gets tried and convicted for his crimes. He's actually convicted for sorcery, which I think is funny. A Frankenstein guy getting committed for sorcery, but you know, that's what they call it when you revive something from the dead. He's then condemned to an insane asylum, and in that insane asylum, he finds Dr. Frankenstein is the head doctor. So let's talk about what I like about this movie. Well, first of all, I love the setting. This insane asylum is great. And I love this whole setup. The whole movie takes place in there where Dr. Frankenstein is the head doctor, though he used to be a patient. He blackmailed the very slimy, sleazy director in there into not being a patient anymore, getting to just head up as doctor and gets to do whatever he wants while he's in there. He finds out him and Dr. Simon Helder have all of the same interests. So he makes him his assistant, and there they continue their Dr. Frankenstein experiments. But that whole setup, the setting, it's something different and definitely something interesting. I really like that way to take things forward. And if you think about the past movies in the series, I do still think Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed is a one-off. I'm not really taking that into continuity. But if we look at the movie before, Frankenstein Created Woman, I think this continues things very well. Because at the end of that movie, you know, Frankenstein's creation jumps off a cliff to their death. And I figure the townspeople figured out what Dr. Frankenstein's role in that was tried him, sent him to this asylum, and now we continue the story in this movie. I also think that continuity works because of the next thing I like about this movie, and that is Peter Cushing as Dr. Frankenstein. Now, he makes an awesome entrance when he comes into this movie with a top hat, a cane. He's looking awesome, except for the fact that he does have a pretty fake looking wig. It's not super great, but Peter Cushing was in poor health when he made this movie. They shot this film the year after his wife, Helen, passed away, and Anybody who knows anything about Peter Cushing knows that his wife's death just devastated him and it really took down his health, his appearance. But even taking that into account, Peter Cushing is awesome in this movie. He is in top form. Back as this character, what it feels like Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed was this weird detour into a different character. In that film, he had become a full-on sadist. I'm afraid that stupidity always brings out the worst in me. No more just the amoral character 
character whose main purpose is science, but a complete monster who just wants to hurt people. Here, it feels like his character from Revenge of Frankenstein, Frankenstein Created Woman, is back. He's not completely horrific, but he is an amoral character who will do anything it takes to further his experiments. I actually think his entire character is summed up very well in one small little conversation in this movie when they're discussing how to get the brain from somebody who's still alive that they want a brain from. You wouldn't kill him. You think I would do that? No. But you're so dedicated. I think that perfectly sums everything up. Would he do something so evil? Well, no, but he's so dedicated. Would he do anything it takes? in order to further his experiments? The answer is always yes. I also like our token young man in this movie, Dr. Helder, actually not named Hans, like most of the young men in this series. He's played by an actor named Shane Bryant, who's no stranger to Hammer Films. He was also in Demons of the Mind, Straight On Till Morning, and most famously, Captain Kronos, Vampire Hunter. I think he's good in this. He's pretty low key. There's not a ton of character to him, but I just think it's interesting that he is a Frankenstein fanboy. He's not some unwilling guy who gets pulled into Frankenstein's experiments. He's a guy who loves this stuff. He is in. He wants to do these experiments. And it's not until later in the movie when he starts to have more of a conscience. I didn't know what to think. But I think all of that makes him an interesting character. And I like the actor. I mean, sure, he's like a pretty boy, but he's not boring. And as long as we're talking about the cast, I also like Madeline Smith in this movie as a mute patient in the asylum who works as Dr. Frankenstein's assistant. Madeline Smith, any Hammer fan will know as one of the female leads in The Vampire Lovers. And she actually holds the Guinness World Record for the largest eyes on any human. Being. Okay, that's not actually true, but like, come on, those eyes can stare into your soul. Another thing I'm a fan of about this movie is it's by far the goriest of the Hammer Frankenstein movies, maybe the goriest film Hammer made at all. Now let's take a moment to talk about gore for a little bit, because I know a lot of classic horror fans don't care for gore, they're more a fan of things that are more subtle, right? I am a fan of gore in horror movies when it's practical because I love practical effects and I just love the artistry that goes into gore in a horror film when it's something that people actually made with their hands. And that's what we get in this movie. The gore is actually pretty spectacular. There is a brain transplanting scene because of course there is. I don't even know if YouTube will allow me to show it, but where they saw off the head, pull it off, you see the brain in there, they take it out. It's all in fully lit glorious, gory detail. I love it. This is a pretty savage horror movie. And like I said, even when you compare this to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that came out in 1974, this movie is way, way gorier in terms of what you actually see on screen. <laughs> But let's move a little bit away from the positivity and talk about the monster. Now, David Prowse plays the monster in this movie, and he's actually the only one that would play a monster in more than one Hammer Frankenstein movies. He also played him in Horror of Frankenstein, though with a completely different makeup design. Also, he played a Frankenstein monster in a quick cameo in Casino Royale, an early James Bond spoof from the mid 60s. It's cool to see Peter Cushing and David Prowse together before 1977, when they would both be in Star Wars together. Of course, David Prowse playing the physical performance for Darth Vader. But the design is just insane to me. I can't believe they went with this. Now, why does he look like this? Well, it turns out the origins of this monster are he was a patient at the asylum who Dr. Frankenstein describes as being a throwback, something more animal than man, sort of a missing link kind of a man. With crazy strength, he pulled his bars open, jumped out of his cell, fell to his death, and Dr. Frankenstein revived him and starts replacing body parts to improve him. But the idea that this was actually a guy, a human guy, and he looked like this is so insane. Now, David Prowse talked about how this was a very quick makeup job every day of shooting. It only took him like 30 minutes to get into makeup. And I believe it because it just looks like a suit and a mask. I mean, his mouth barely even moves when he talks. It looks very fake. Now, I do appreciate that they're at least trying to make him look like a monster. In the Peter Cushing series, they haven't really done that since Evil of Frankenstein. And I think I would just feel better about it even if he didn't have so much hair, if he just didn't look quite so ape-like. 
like. But the actual experiment in this movie isn't really anything special. I mean, they revived this guy. They're switching out a few body parts. They're switching out his brain, of course. But the only thing that makes this movie really different is they succeed with the experiment about halfway through. The rest of the movie is them trying to maintain it, trying to keep the body from rejecting the brain. And Frankenstein comes to the conclusion that they need to do something to retain the essence of the man. So they need to mate him with the mute servant girl, Sarah, to have a baby that will be the monster's true essence. Wow, that's brilliant. It doesn't make any sense. It's a pretty small part of this movie, and I think the screenwriters are trying to work something out, and it just didn't really work. But let's rate this movie for atmosphere. I'm giving this a seven. I really like the asylum setting, very atmospheric, a very different setting too. So it definitely sets this movie apart. Plus there's a really good grave robbing scene at the beginning. For characters, I'm gonna give this a seven. Now the best character in the movie, of course, is Dr. Frankenstein. I like that we get the Frankenstein that I love back. This is my preferred characterization for the character and Peter Cushing is great, wig and all. Simon isn't, you know, a fascinating character, but I definitely like him. Sarah Bear speaks, but I think Madeline Smith does the best she can with that part. And the monster looks terrible, although there's definitely some sympathy you can feel for him by the end. For story, I'm going to give this a seven. I really like the story of this movie. I like the way this continues the series because I do think this continues the series of Curse of Frankenstein, Revenge of Frankenstein, Frankenstein Created Woman, and then this movie very well. I think it's a good four-part series with the other ones being one-offs. I like how this moves things forward to the asylum, but the experiment itself is pretty standard. And the ending of this movie is strange for the ending of the whole series because it basically just says nothing's changing and Frankenstein's going to keep doing what he does. For scares, I'm going to give this a five. I love the gore in the movie, which is the main reason this gets as high a rating as it does. And it does get pretty brutal by the end. I can't deny, but I don't like the look of the actual monster. He's very hard to take seriously, which definitely hurts the movie in this category. But I do really like a scene where he goes out into the graveyard near the asylum and digs up the body of the man his brain came from. That's something interesting that we have not seen in this series before. All in all, I'm going to give this movie a seven. I really like it. This is actually only my second time watching the movie. I don't remember being a big fan of it the first time, though it was a long time ago. But this time, I think this is a solid Frankenstein movie that might even be top tier with a better monster. That's it for this one, folks. But make sure you subscribe because the next video on the channel is going to be my ranking of the entire Hammer Frankenstein series. And if you did miss any of the previous reviews, check out this playlist right over here where I've got all of them. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. With all that said, don't forget to enjoy yourself today. Have some fun, and I'll see you next time.